It's Don Kaufman here doing the weekend update for Theo Trade, July 17th, 2020. Can markets hold it together really long enough through this uh, earnings season? Let's kind of quickly recap some of the action we saw in this last week. And of course, uh, look forward to a few more of the earnings announcements coming out this next week. But more importantly, Big time sector rotations in the marketplace. Let's get to work. One of the places I want to start uh, on this weekend's update is right here inside of the SPX. If you take a look at the SPX uh, on this previous week of trade, we ground slightly higher. Some of the ranges started to die out, though, in this week of trade. So I was seeing, you know, it's kind of a docile move inside of the S&P 500 and a docile move with some grinding action to the upside. But uh, the NASDAQ, uh, well, let's just get right down to it. The NASDAQ, fits of rage have still been felt inside of the uh, the NASDAQ. In this case, we'll go over to the QQQ. And uh, when I come over here to the Qs, I'm going to apply uh, auto expected moves. And the reason I'm applying this particular study is I want you to see this just wicked divergence that's kind of played out. When I start talking about the divergence, we're going to get more into uh, into depth about that divergence between like the NASDAQ and the IWM and the spiders. We're going to look at a full-blown sector comparison in here. But uh, the point that I'm trying to make, and I was making in last weekend's video, first and foremost, the uh, the NASDAQ exploded out and above its expected move two weeks in a row, which uh, brought us to the conclusion, and if you saw last weekend's video, brought us to the conclusion there should be a uh, sharp and violent pullback inside of the NASDAQ. We got it. We did get that pullback, but, you know, quite frankly, it just doesn't feel like enough. But nevertheless, we did get, you know, that kind of quintessential pullback. In fact, we pulled back right under the edge of the expected move and in the week slightly lower. But the point that I wanted to make again with this before we go too deep into uh, divergences and convergences and so forth is, again, the Nasdaq has defected lower. Whereas if you take a look at the S&Ps, the S&Ps actually finished the week uh, albeit slightly higher. Then I'm going to throw this one in there just fun when uh, we apply the auto expected moves. You're aware that the Russell, the Russell actually exceeded the upside of the expected move on the back of some of the smaller banks, which actually had some decent earnings. It's just all over the place this particular week. So you got Russell higher, NASDAQ lower, S&P is kind of skirting right through the middle. Before I go any further and I start to do some of the comparison work, I wanted to reiterate again, a, uh, a bit of a warning to you if you were trading inside of the NASDAQ or uh, maybe not aware necessarily of the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ is still, as I said, throwing off fits of rage every trading session, okay, in really the last week of trade, it's actually slightly over a week, has seen the marketplace inside of the NASDAQ, specifically the NASDAQ futures, just get wildly bidless. Now, that's a phrase that I've just used time and time again. And a lot of people like, you know, this, this, I call it the bidless beast. And that is ultimately, if you take a quick glance uh, over here at the NASDAQ futures, ah, right up there is about uh, 10,640. That's a drop right over there to 10,570. And uh, this is uh, literally one minute candles. You're looking basically at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, let's just call it a cool 10 minutes. In 10 minutes, that kind of a drop. And I'll tell you what, this one on this Friday, that was absolutely nothing. Here's actually a very similar drop that happened ultimately in three minutes, right? That kind of action inexplicable. It's just rushing into the marketplace. And what's interesting about it is the NASDAQ is actually leading the order flow, uh, meaning that if you take a look at the, uh, the S&Ps, and I looked at this in depth, it is absolutely unequivocally algorithms that are coming specifically into not just the NASDAQ futures. And I don't want to just point a finger and say, oh, it's the NASDAQ that's going bidless over here. The trade is actually persisting in and around the quote unquote monsters of tech. That's specifically the Microsofts, the Apples, you know, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Google. And these particular underlyings in Google here is a prime example in today's trade. Google went literally bidless, okay? Why, how, there's not a huge number, you know, of uh, trades necessarily going through over here, but it's enough to actually rock the market in very, okay, short instances. And again, I call it kind of the bidless beast. It seems to be showing up literally 
and seemingly out of nowhere in trade. So uh, as I said in a lot of previous videos over the last uh, couple of trading sessions, and it's worth like take some time, okay? Go back to one minute chart, go back for instance like five days, look precisely what I'm talking about. Don't just look necessarily, by the way, this one over here, that's ah, Netflix earnings, toss that one aside. Don't look just necessarily at the uh, at the NASDAQ futures. What I want you to uh, to get comfortable with is this could show up and show up in a big way, okay? And it could show up in any equity. Uh, specifically, Apple has actually received just hideous sell-side activity in short amount of time. I mean, come on, people, that's Apple. Apple goes bidless, drops from 395 all the way down to roughly, uh, let's call it 388 in the midst of 10 minutes, okay? These are not healthy moves. And again, even though that the S&Ps were docile on a relative basis, okay, the NASDAQ, it's just having outright tantrums right now. And is this going to be persistent is a key portion of being able to decipher trade in this next week. Uh, and I'll tell you exactly why. We're going to come to expected move. The expected move inside of the SPX, it's not large. Uh, this is going to be a $74 expected move, which I'll cover here towards towards the end. That doesn't exactly make me warm and fuzzy. Like, there's no way. There's no way I'm selling. There's no way I'm selling any options premium right now, given the fact that the expected move is contracted. Yet over in the NASDAQ, we're seeing again. And the NASDAQ, you have to recognize and Apples and Microsofts and, you know, Google and Amazon, they could collectively take apart the entire S&P 500 in a hurry if uh, if that bidless beast shows up and, uh, you know, doesn't abate. So with that, push that aside for a second. The NASDAQ having tantrums, maybe come back to that. Let's talk a little bit about sectors, sectors and driving trade. So I said tech is lagging, and I'll start with that. When I say tech is lagging, I mean specifically, yeah, we're looking at the QQQ. Okay, but more appropriately, we're going to look at this um, on a on a much more highly detailed level. As I said, I applied auto expected moves. You can just see the Nasdaq is towards the uh, the lagging edge over here. And then when I apply auto expected moves to the XLF, which are the financials, the financials are all kinds of bid up. So it's been the exact opposite lately. If you uh, if you haven't uh, looked at much trade. Okay, which you've actually had in a lot of recent trade, and I'll just uh, kind of mark this on the screen for you, is the uh, the financials here have been relatively soft, okay, and the NASDAQ has been straight up, and the S&Ps have been kind of skirting through the middle. So this is the exact opposite in this week of trade. Um, if we just want to, uh, to zoom in for one moment over here, you zoom in. What have you actually seen over uh, really the last uh, two weeks trade is uh, is a bid and a very steady bid come into the financials. And the irony of that is the financials, which I'll also talk about here momentarily, they had earnings this week. And the earnings, <laughs> there's a huge question mark over that one. The marketplace just said, ah, it's a gimme on, uh, on earnings. I'll come back to that. But I wanted you to see, again, that vast departure from a lot of the trade that we've seen. And right now, oh, that's absolutely a sign. I mean, the NASDAQ, again, has been supporting the S&Ps. And all of a sudden, we have this, this big shift, okay? But when I talk about tech is lagging and financials are leading, um, I also, I, I think I'll bring this into, uh, into scope over here. If you take a look at the trading session like we just had today, and look at the S&P 100. Ironically, the S&P 100, the advanced decline line was about 50-50, but uh, neither here nor there. Check this out in terms of the sectors. The sectors that were driving trade, like utilities, <laughs> utilities, that, that really drove the markets higher today. I mean, utilities like a little peanut of a trade, real estate, another like peanut in terms of a sector. And then we had healthcare. All right. And then like literally like healthcare, and we'll pull up XLV. We'll just do the uh, the ETF that represents, of course, uh, healthcare. Take a look at healthcare in this last week of trade. It didn't just smoke the expected move. And everybody seemed to miss this. It didn't smoke the expected move. It just it doubled it. I mean, you're almost three times the expected move over here, like a statistical anomaly. So if you're curious, like how how could the S&Ps possibly be up this week? Okay, because you're going to see some some marquee stocks. And when I was talking about tech is lagging, right? Look at some of the marquee stocks. Okay, here's Microsoft. Were you aware that Microsoft actually, with earnings coming up next week, cracked the lower edge of the expected move? Okay, Apple. Apple finished the week largely unchanged. Like, how could the whole market not you know not be down? Because what went on here? 
okay, was this wild rotation. When I say a wild rotation, what I'm actually referencing in this particular case is we moved, again, out of the NASDAQ, and I'll just kind of draw it on your screen, specifically, okay, trade started flowing out of the NASDAQ, and they started shoving capital into what? XLF, okay, and XLV. So these are actually two sectors that are large enough to actually influence the marketplace as, again, tech didn't just get decimated. It didn't, okay? But it definitely slipped to the downside. And it's being covered up by the fact that uh, healthcare and the financials are a little bit bid, which is, again, it's kind of ironic given that the financials, real mixed bag of goods when it came to some of the earnings announcements. So that's why I wanted to see, you know, want you to see what sectors are actually driving trade because, Again, these sector rotations, it's like a little game of whack-a-mole, you know? One sector goes down, pop, another one actually flies up, not necessarily because they have wonderful things going on. Of course, people are going to point to, you know, the vaccines and healthcare. Yeah, but you can also, what? You're going to point to financials and tell me the financials had spectacular earnings, okay? Because they didn't. I mean, listen, the financials, you know, had a mixed bag of goods when it came to uh, down to it. And uh, yet they still pop to the upside simply because, tech came down. So again, it looks like we're playing the rotation game. This is a very quantitative metric, you know, and this happens and will continue until the music ultimately stops. And that's why we look, we look so carefully at these convergences and divergences, which is exactly the next thing we're going to look at over here. And again, this stuff starts to get a little bit complicated, but here is a comparison chart. And I'll tell you exactly why this gets a little complicated. Here's a comparison chart. And this one's actually the last three months Okay, and what you have right there is the QQQ, okay? Right here in the middle is the IWM, and the SPY is actually lagging, okay? So in the last three months on a comparison chart, the SPY is lagging, the QQQ is still accelerating. But here's the most important thing, and I was, I was talking about this in the Wednesday night video. The most important thing to take away from this comparison is that the NASDAQ, okay, this NASDAQ is going like this. And the IWM is going like this. They're converging. And the craziest thing is convergence like you're seeing between the QQQ and the IWM typically only happens in down markets. And I'll, I'll prove that one to you. Just uh, I'll, I'll prove it to you visually, okay, without going into uh, mathematics of convergence and divergence and looking at different, you know, differentials of deltas, okay? Take a look back over the last year. So this is the last year. And what you'll learn by looking at the last year, look, when we converge, that's the cues, okay? When we converge is typically when we are crashing and burning to the downside. We very, very rarely converge on an upswing. And I'll take it even a step further, all right? So that's, uh, that's just like the last year. But anytime we're converging, there's our, over the last three years, anytime we're converging, take a look. A fit of rage, volatility, volatility, okay? Anytime you converge, volatility, you're converging Okay, in the marketplace that's headed down. So I'm telling you right now, okay, you've been warned here on the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ's coming in and coming in heavily. And uh, you better keep a very close eye on that trade because all of this crap works. Like people are like, oh, whatever, man, I'll be long. I'll be long until it stops. When the music stops, there's no chance of getting out. Okay, if the music stops, the one thing that I'll reiterate time and again over here, look at the NASDAQ. Okay, the risk reward in here is absolutely horrific. Okay, if you're gonna be bullish right now, you just, you just can't hold, you know, some of these stocks. You just can't do it. There's no diversification. And if we get bidless, like that's why I actually showed you the NASDAQ getting bidless. If we, if we become a bidless beast again, uh, you get on the wrong side of it, it's over. It's going to be over well before you're ever going to be able to exit the portfolio. But that's why I wanted to go through in such depth. Okay, I'm going to take you even a step further here. Here's actually a sector comparison. If you're kind of curious about the, uh, the sectors themselves. This is a full-blown sector comparison. I know it's like the great spaghetti incident over here, but on top, this is the XLK, which is technology, on the very bottom over here, that's the XLE, which is the energy sector, okay? Over here, ironically, is the uh, the financials. So what are you learning here over the last year? The divergences are huge, but again, I will reiterate, even over the last three years, every time we get volatile, every time we get volatile, what do we do? We converge, we converge, okay? We converge. Right now, we're converging, and, and, okay, the markets haven't actually tanked. So you've got to be really careful right now. Again, we are sh uh, throwing off 
signs right now, if you will, of some uh, some heavy volatility coming. It's, you know what, though? That's not something you can easily time. And for those of you, if you like that sector comparison, there's a lot of trades you could do in the sector comparison. You can get long financial, short tech, okay, which hadn't really paid out. By the way, I am. I'm in that position right now. I'm actually, okay, I am short the QQQ and long the IWM, and I'm, I'm actually in that position in a couple of different ways. Uh, I'm in index pairs, futures pairs trades. I've got a couple of different accounts where I've actually created sub accounts specifically for those types of trades. All right, let's continue to kind of move on. There's a reason I showed you the sectors, and that's because, again, the convergence makes me very nervous, along with the fact that the QQQ, the NASDAQ, is having outright tantrums. The next thing we want to cover the VIX, the VIX, okay? The VIX is lying on the floor, but it ain't dead yet. The point that I wanted to make with uh, with the VIX, let me actually uh, get here. When I say lying uh, on the floor, that's what I mean, okay? Here's your floor. Your floor basically is a 25 and it is lying on the floor, but there's something crazy going on inside of the VIX and I'll, I'll tell you exactly what it is. If you look all the way out, like 60 days out, okay? They've completely, they, the market has completely Okay, they is the market. The market has completely crushed all premium out of like the 20 puts. And in doing so, right, what it basically, what is what does that mean? Okay, look at the implied volatility of the puts. Okay, the implied volatility of these VIX puts all the way out, we're 60 days out, is like 56. The implied volatility of the calls is like 150. It's killing my ability, just killing my ability to create really good trades inside of the VIX. So what you have to do in the VIX, you have to get a little bit more, you know, cute in the VIX if you're going to create some uh, some VIX, VIX style trades. Like you can come out here and you can sell, for instance, one, okay, sell two. So I'm going to sell like two VIX puts to turn around and buy. Let me open up a ton of strikes over here to turn around and buy some like way out of the money, just way out of the money, like spreads in here. And it's still being done for a debit. What I'm doing is trying to finance trying to finance the call spread is a $40 wide call spread by selling two puts and I'm not paying 30 cents and taking risk. It's just not, it's not working right now. Okay. I want to take some long shot trades in the VIX. Like I want to buy and you could see, I've already done it when the pricing was better. I did. I bought a ton of out of the money like spreads. Okay. But right now the pricing it's not letting me. And I'm letting you guys know it's not letting me. I, I don't mind showing you a trade that's just, you know, ah, that crap ain't working right now. But there's another way to do this. And it's going to take on a little bit more risk where you could actually sell. You could actually come in here and you could sell like the 25 puts by the 20, uh, 20 puts. That thing is going to give you $1.65 credit. But if the VIX were to migrate back down to 20, Oh, raggy, you're going to lose some money in there and then turn around and actually buy, uh, you know, a bunch of out of the money spreads with this. OK, and that's again, we get, you know, a little bit more, you know, cute soon. We start to get into trades like this. But that's something I will cover a bit more inside of the chat room. Of course, uh, for those that are uh, Theo trade clientele early in the week, I'll actually build a couple of different VIX trades for you. Um, and again, they're going to have to take a little bit more risk. So the VIX right now is uh, lying on the floor, but not completely dead. And I say also not completely dead. It's at 25. I mean, come on, a 25 VIX. Do you realize over the last five years of trade, you'd be like, oh, the VIX is 25. That's some of the highest levels in the VIX. I mean, this thing is still a gap filled wonderland. I also want to remind you when we're talking about the VIX, the VVIX is still in the VAMA zone. Okay. For those of you that have never actually heard that terminology board, the VAMA zone. Okay. VAMA means the volatility of the volatility. It's like, you know, the speed at which volatility moves. Well, the VVIX is the volatility of the volatility. Anything north of 110, okay, I call the VAMA zone. We haven't really been south of 110 pretty much since the uh, the corona the corona hit us. And uh, here we still sit. I mean, what it basically means, professional trade is still out there and they're scared. I mean, they're scared. They're still buying hedges every way, shape, or form. So keep that in mind onward and upward from there. The other thing I want you guys to know, and this is just a quick glance here. This is for you to decide. The metals are they're just flying. Like I could bring up a copper chart, but nobody needs to see copper. Like here's uh here's gold. That's gold. Gold's having an absolutely 
phenomenal kind of breakout to the upside. In fact, you got to open up like a full blown gold. Looks like it's going to go for it. Gold's going to go for like an all time high in here. But I also wanted to mention uh, SLV because I am long SLV. SLV a couple of years back had an absolutely uh, stellar breakout, huge short, short squeeze in here. But the point that I wanted to make your metals, they're flying right now. Okay. And there's, there's one of two ways to look at this. The metals are flying because it's either inflationary or it's some type of a hedge, a protective type trade. You be the judge on that one. I just wanted to point it out because not enough people are looking at it. They're just not paying attention. Like, you know, if there were, if there were like literally, you know, signs along the way, you know, what are the signs? Well, the NASDAQ goes into a bidless fit of rage day in and day out. Uh, okay, there's a sign. The metals, okay, are in a very protective stance. Oh, okay, there's a sign. The VVIX says, duck and cover, get under your desk and start rocking back and forth. Uh, okay, there's a sign. Like, uh, again, all of these added up really start to make me nervous. Now, the bonds, the bonds haven't necessarily played into any of this yet, okay? But the bonds, they're napping right now. I don't trust them as far as you can throw them. The influence of the Fed over here is making the bonds quite muddled. Nevertheless, I think that the bonds are going to be reactive. If the S&P start to tank, the bonds are going to fly. So uh, be, on, be on the lookout for that one. But there's a lot of signs right now still of risk coming in. And it's just, hey, the risk, as we just showed you in the VVIX, it just, it has not abated. All right, onward and upward, earnings and earnings trades. Big banks, specifically, when I talk about big banks, come over here to the XLF, okay? Kind of a fun irony. The banks, they report it all over the place. When we talk about banks, you know, it wouldn't be fun if we didn't talk about Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs breaks to the upside and fades. Oh, it's huge. When we start looking at some of the big banks, though, Bank of America ends the week towards the lower edge of the expected move. Okay, JP Morgan. JP Morgan didn't move much on the earnings, kind of reverted back down. But JP Morgan is one of the big banks. And specifically, Jamie Dimon said, well, they're putting away and stashing away huge amounts of cash. The bottom line is they said, in terms of defaults, the worst is yet to come. And quite frankly, they just don't know how much capital to put aside. Interestingly enough, with all that being said, you can look at City. City actually broke to the downside of the expected move. Wells Fargo, what have they done for me lately? Absolutely nothing. Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley had some uh, strong results, broke to the upside. But again, net net, you know, like the banks didn't exactly have positive things to say. Again, specifically uh, JP Morgan. Everybody watches JP Morgan because it's the biggest of the big. But um, they're putting aside literally billions and billions of dollars and no one has any clue any clue if it's going to be enough. Um, we're not getting a clear picture inside of the financials. Okay. The earnings are down basically 50% year over year and nobody seems to question it. Uh, but nobody also, they kind of give them a pass. It's like everybody has gotten a pass so far in earnings. And I also put in here, Netflix, okay. Netflix, uh, how do I say this eloquently? Netflix barfed on their earnings. Okay. They projected the number of subscribers to be down. I don't necessarily think like Netflix has implications though to other stocks. Okay. Just because Netflix, you know, puked on the earnings. Listen, Netflix did exactly what they said they were going to do in terms of expected move. See, everybody pays attention to like what they're saying. The subscriber growth in the third quarter. Who cares? Like, seriously, who cares? The expected move was 44 bucks, okay? And Netflix, no matter, it didn't matter what Netflix said, they moved, okay? They pretty much moved to the edge of what was expected. If you looked at the Netflix throughout the course of the trading day, Netflix had actually moved down some 44 bucks, sat there, eh, kind of migrated, but they did what they ex were expected to do. And it's barfed, but they barfed right into the edge of the expected move. The point that I'm making of this, it didn't matter what the numbers were. It didn't matter what Reed Hastings said, who is now the co-CEO. All that mattered was the expected move. And that's one thing I want you to, uh, to remember moving forward into earnings. The big one coming this week, not everything is coming with earnings this week. You're still, you know, like a week away from, uh, from an Apple. It's a little over a week. It's almost two weeks away from an Apple. Okay. You got to wait a little bit for a, uh, for a Facebook to the following week, Amazon, you got to wait again to the following week, but Microsoft, okay. Microsoft is going to get served up on a platter. 
uh, this next week, which is this one's going to be important. There's no question because it can be a market moving event. Uh, nevertheless, I'd pay very close attention to the expected move, which is currently about $11 and change. Nothing more, nothing less. Like, there's no reason to assess, like, what do you think it's going to do? Well, we're going to trade it. And we're going to trade a lot of the earnings, um, but we're going to trade it for the edge of the expected move, right? Okay. Last, but definitely not least, the uh, SPX expected move. But again, Everything right now is about these expected moves. Either you think we're going to crack through them or you think we're going to stay inside of them. And when it comes down to it, and I look at the SPX, okay, there's some, uh, something I will definitely uh, reiterate kind of time and again. When we look at the SPX, the SPX is the quintessential mother of all products. It's sitting right around a $74 expected move for the next week of trade, which um, if you compare it to the previous week, we had a $76 expected move. That just leads me to believe like EM, it's just light. OK, uh, and when I say it's light, look, people, how many breaches of expected move there have been lately. And why do I circle those four? Because every time we breach the expected move, these are the opportunities. OK, those are some of the biggest opportunities. It's why I've actually been buying option premium. And since the whole Corona crash kicked off, OK, it has been Mr. Toad's wild ride of ripping through expected moves. And I'll tell you right now, OK. This $74 expected move that we've got this next week, and again, I will reiterate this, right here, that $74 expected move, that means $74 higher or $74 lower, that kind of expected move is the lightest expected move that we've seen okay, anytime recently. And of course, everybody's like, it's mid-July. Listen, summer, no one cares right now. You're still sitting at home. Nobody's traveling out to the Hamptons because they've been there since March, right? So traders, listen, $74 expected move is really, really light. you know. And for me, I look at all the other factors on the screen. People just get ready to rumble. I mean, the NASDAQ futures, they were up today. By the way, uh, last mention over here, NASDAQ futures were up today, but the QQQ was basically flat. You should understand the NASDAQ futures were up, okay, because effectively the previous night, okay, they close, the NASDAQ futures, they close at a different time. And again, I have to bring up a couple more uh, days over here. Let's actually bring up two days and you'll see exactly what I'm referencing. The NASDAQ futures, okay, were influenced by Netflix earnings. They dropped like a rock. Even though at that time the Nasdaq was already closed, the Nasdaq futures continue to trade and after hours they drop like a rock. That's why what we call a fair value differentiation between the Nasdaq futures and the QQQ. So net net when you're looking at the marketplace, the spiders, okay, they closed the week and Friday's trade was roughly unchanged. The Nasdaq was roughly unchanged on uh, on this Friday. Nevertheless, the futures themselves look a little bit bid up. But again, I uh, I give you strong caution. There's not a huge amount of economic news coming out. Eh, something out of Europe, of course, as there's deep negotiations going on over there. Not a huge amount of, uh, of economic news. But this next week, I think it's pivotal. It's pivotal for trade. In the S&Ps, we got to get off the 32, like 11K level. And uh, we've been hovering right around this 3,200 Net net, uh, once again, I'd get ready for some volatility, and I think it's going to come specifically out of the NASDAQ. I've been watching it like a hawk in terms of trade. Let's see if the bid list beast shows up in uh, early in the week. I will tell you this. I'm going to go after a lot of trades early in the week, a lot of trades early in the week. I want to be a net buyer, a net buyer of volatility. That's how I'm actually going to go into the next couple of weeks to trade. Buy the volatility when you can. Volatility is inherently low versus where it has been recently. I want to be a net buyer of vol. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here at Theo Trade. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.